Father, we thank you for who you are and that who you are reveals who we are and that you're good. So we worship you, Father, in Jesus' name and we pray that we would speak your word this morning. Amen. Well, it's great to see you if you're here from Minnesota or South Carolina or Alaska. Is anybody here from Colorado? Is there any of you? Anybody? Some of you are here. That's good. Yeah, my, my friend uh, Walt and Renee had a party for their parents down in Monument, yeah, so invited everybody, which is great, and John and Karen are here from Minnesota who are online, and it was just good to, to see everybody. Father's Day is when most people go fishing, so thanks for coming to church. It is Father's Day, and so I thought I ought to preach a Father's Day message, and on Father's Day, everyone is asking the question, right? Most They're asking the question, what do I get for Father? What do I get the man who has everything? That's a particularly challenging question for a kid. I remember getting my father a poster of the Himalayas, and he said, oh, wow, Peter, this is awesome. Why don't you hang it in your room? And and so, of course, I did, and so, of course, he also had paid for the poster, and so, of course, I thought, well, that was really a great present that I got my dad on Father's Day. What do you get the man who has everything is a challenging question for all children, uh, in particular if your father is God, right? For then, he not only has all the tie class cologne bottles and t-shirts that he needs, he literally has everything including you and your sisters, in my case. I had two of them. That kind of complicates things. A Christian believes that God is his or her father, so what do you get him? People are always asking me, what does God, our father, want from me? And maybe we should ask then our big brother, Jesus, who loved his father to the point of death. We ought to ask Jesus, what does God, our father, want? What? What would you get, God, for Father's Day, which, of course, is a Sunday, which is an eighth day, which is also a first day, the Lord's Sabbath day? What would you get him for Easter? We ought to ask Jesus if, in fact, we are his disciples. How many of you consider yourself, well, you can raise your hand if you want to, to be a disciple? That means a learner of Jesus. Yeah, some of you, some of you, that's good. It's Father's Day, so I thought I ought to preach on a Father's Day message, so I thought I'd look at Jesus' famous story about um, our Father in Luke chapter 15, and I noticed this verse right before it in Luke chapter 14. This is verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Do you hear that, disciples? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, he cannot be my disciple. Art Linkletter and Bill Cosby used to have this show. Do you remember? It was called Kids Say the Darndest Things. I think the whole Bible should be titled, Jesus Says the Darndest Things. I mean, Matthew records Jesus is saying this, he who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And that kind of makes some sense, right? Get your love priority down or whatever. But Luke, the only Gentile author in the New Testament, he records Jesus as saying something like this, to follow me, you have to hate your own father. That's nuts. For, for quite a, f- a few reasons. Number one, for the Jew, honor your father and mother is the fifth commandment in the law that Jesus said he came to fulfill. And that if you relax one iota, it, it, it won't be relaxed until all is accomplished. Secondly, you also have to ask this question. Did Jesus hate his own father? Ironically, the Jews seek to kill Jesus for 
suggesting or, or saying, at least according to them, that God was his own father. He doesn't say it in the same way as Luke is recording it here, but even if he did, didn't the Jews say that God was their own father? And yet Jesus taught us all to say, our father. Number three, this statement is followed by the most famous love your father story in all of scripture, the story of the prodigal son which should seriously be titled the prodigal father, for it's about two boys that really struggle to love their father, and the father who loves them both relentlessly, when they probably should both be dead. Anyway, Luke 14, 26. If anyone does not hate his own heatu, father, he cannot be my disciple. Heatu is this rather strange little reflexive pronoun in Greek, which sometimes goes untranslated. It means something like himself. So Jesus is not saying hate the father, but hate the father of yourself, which the English Standard Version then renders as own father. Maybe you could kind of even say the father that you think you own. 14, 28 through 32 talks about the cost of being a disciple. Then he says in verse 33, if any of you does not renounce all that he has, literally all the possessions of himself, he ought to, all that he owns, he cannot be my disciple. 34 through 35, he talks about being salty, salt of the earth, you remember that. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us that salty, flavorful people are poor in spirit. In other words, they don't possess anything. Next line. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Tax collectors and sinners are probably poor in spirit. I mean, they don't believe that God the Father belongs to them. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. In other words, he acts as if they're family, as if his father is their father and their father is his father. And so the Pharisees grumbled. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that he has lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Hey, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And I hope you see what Jesus is doing. He's posing a question for the Pharisees. You get all excited about a lost sheep that is found. You get all excited about a lost coin that is found. But how do you feel about lost people, tax collectors and sinners that just may have happened to have been found? The word translated as lost is the Greek word ap apolumi, which is also translated as perish or perished or, or destroyed. So the lost are the destroyed or those that have perished. And it's worth noting that you can't be found unless you were lost. And you certainly can't know that you've been found unless you know that you've been lost. And according to Luke, Jesus said that he came to seek and to save the lost after he revealed that people in the days of Noah were the lost and that people of Sodom were also the lost. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, which obviously upset the Pharisees. And he just said something else that must have really pissed them off. He just equated repentance with being found. 
not with finding, but being found. So repentance is not a thing we do in order to get found, but getting found is the thing done to us that is called repentance. You don't find a new mind, right? Because what would you find it with? You can't think your way to it. You don't find a new mind, but a, a new mind has to find you, metanoia, new mind. That's what, what repentance means. Getting found causes us to repent. So if you're proud of repentance, as if you found yourself, it's not repentance. <laughs> and you haven't been found. So you Pharisees, says Jesus in effect, you rejoice over a lost sheep and a lost coin because they have intrinsic value. Regardless of their own decisions or lack of decisions, they don't create their value. Sheep and coins don't decide to be found. You rejoice over a lost sheep, a lost coin, but will you rejoice over a lost boy? If not, perhaps you haven't been found. Verse 11, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property, Usios, that is coming to me. And he divided his property, Bios, between them. Usios is literally translated as substance. So in systematic theology, you'll hear that word a lot. Homo eusios, homo eusios is substance, or perhaps beingness. It's the feminine form of beingness or amness, as in I amness. Bios is the root of our word biology. It means life. So the younger son says, Father, give me my share of your substance. And amazingly, right here at the start of the story, the father divides his bios, his life, between them. Between them. The older son, you see, also appears to take his portion and he has not stopped the younger son from asking the question and taking his portion. In that culture, what the younger son asks and what the older son concedes to is a profound evil. It's basically saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And I want your stuff. Or even worse, it's saying, Dad, you are the stuff that I want. Your substance and your life as my possession. I want you in a box coffin. I think that's just what the world was saying when we took the life of Christ on the tree in the garden on Calvary. I think it's just what we all say in Adam when we take the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is also the life in the garden of Eden. Father, give me the share of Usias that is coming to me. And he divided his bios between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his usion, his property, in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he ought to, his own self. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my, my own, he ought to, my own father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." The way Jesus tells the story, it becomes clear that his own self, the self that he owns, the reflexive self, the self that's stuck on itself, may not have been such a great self to come to. But rather, it may have actually been that self which was still lost. This boy doesn't want to be a son, you see. He wants to be an employee. He wants to earn his father's stuff, as if he could pay him back. And so he practices his speech, he's still lost. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran 
and embraced him and, and kissed him. The Greek implies that he passionately kissed him over and over and over. He'd been watching and waiting and looking. And when he caught a glimpse of his boy, this old man lifted up his robes and he began to run. He ran through the village. Uh, a great indignity for a gentleman in that day. He would have ran past a mob at the edge of the village waiting to stone his boy, as Deuteronomy 21.20 clearly requires. The Pharisees knew this verse well. <laughs> See, the death of the rebellious boy was to cleanse Israel of the community of, of the evil. But the father ran past the crowd, embraced his son out on the road, at road and, and before the boy could get a word in edgeways, before he could say anything, earn anything, decide anything, do anything, this father just covers him with kisses, kisses that change the boy's mind. Metanoia. That's repentance. It's his kindness that leads to Repentance. And the boy would not have known his father's kindness if he had not slept with pigs in the far country. The kiss changes the boy's mind for when the boy delivers his speech, he leaves out the last line. <laughs> Jesus was very careful about how he told his stories. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Period. Period. He doesn't say, make me a hired servant, an employee. He wants to be a son. He's no longer lost. He's just been found. And the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The robe is righteousness. The ring's probably a signet ring. It's his identity. The shoes are freedom to go wherever he desires. The shoes are free will. Robe, ring, and shoes, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. And they began to party. They began to celebrate. It's such a beautiful story. I've preached on it at least three times, kind of three times with bringing out three different meanings, different ways. All those messages are really good, and you should listen to them or read them or watch them online. November 12, 2006, Lost Boys and How to Find Them. And then August 25, 2013, Party Penance. November 15, 2015, The Kiffs That Blows the, the Mind. I've preached on it many times, but never have enough time to do it justice. Because you see, Jesus still hasn't gotten to the reason that he's telling the story to scribes and Pharisees who were upset with him for partying with tax collectors and sinners, as if their father was his father and his father was their father. Verse 24, they began to celebrate. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because... Well, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fat calf for him? And he, the father, said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting, it was necessary to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And that's where Jesus ends the story. Kind of like where we are right now. So let's ask ourselves a few questions about the story, okay? Number one, where's heaven? That's an easy one, right? Heaven is the, the party. It's a sacrificial communion of life. It's a bunch of people that have lost themselves and then found themselves in a common delight. 
a bunch of people that have humbled themselves and found themselves enjoying one another. It's literally a symphonia. That's the word translated as music in the text. A symphonia is music. It's a bunch of individual phonos or sounds or notes, all unified by a common logos or or rhythm. It's a dance. It's a bunch of individuals literally incarnating, that's putting flesh on the symphonia together as one body, one synchronized dancing body. It's not a bunch of individual people each stuck on themselves. That's not a party. That's a crowd making noise. Heaven is the party inside the house. And check this out. The inside of the house is bigger than the entire outside of the house. For the Father's house is the Holy of Holies, which is in the temple that we've been talking about, the Holy of Holies, which is the presence of the endless seventh day, the eighth day that is also the first day. And check this out, heaven is at hand. Maybe a way you could say that is that the older brother can hear the singing and the dancing as he stands alone in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing his teeth. So number two, where's hell? Well, and if you've been around here, you you would know this. This might be a new thought to some people. The Bible has several different words that get translated by that word. But if by hell we mean Hades or Sheol, What Jesus refers to as the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. If that's what we mean by hell, then the older brother who thinks he's always obeyed his father's command is in hell. Scripture is clear on this. It begins here and now and often continues in the depths of the earth in the grave after the body dies. That's what we've called hell number one. And if by hell we mean the consuming fire, well, our Father is a consuming fire. And he has just ascended into the outer darkness, which was just called hell. So he's given hell, hell. Given hell to hell. He's hell number two in hell number one. And if by hell we mean Gehenna, which is the dark valley at the edge of Jerusalem, which becomes the new Jerusalem, well, then this is what the Father is giving and the older son is receiving right now. That is eternal judgment. That would be hell number two upon hell number one, which is hell number three, the presence of eternity in space and time. (laughs) Question number three, who's forgiven? Well, that's kind of easy too. The younger brother is at the party, right? And he is entirely forgiven. He's just squandered his entire inheritance on reckless living, which according to the old brother means prostitute. He's he's lost all of his inheritance, and he cannot pay it back. And he doesn't have to pay it back. He's forgiven. But is the older brother forgiven? Well... Yeah, right? I mean, he also received his share of the inheritance, which was at least collusion in this great crime. But the father hasn't asked for any of it back. So yes. And no. There is one thing for which he will never, ever, ever be forgiven. In other words, he must pay this thing back. If the, if the bank doesn't forgive you the loan, it means you've got to pay it back. He has to pay this back or at least give it back. He must surrender this in order, in order to join the party. And of course, I'm talking about forgiveness. The older brother is committing the unforgivable sin. For you see, the party itself is constant forgiveness. Aphiomi in Greek, it means to let, to allow. It means to stop demanding payment. The unforgivable sin is blasphemy of the Spirit, which is the breath, which is the life of God. At a great party, just as in one body, 
the Spirit, the breath, circulates through all the members, right? As grace and love and goodwill. What do we call it? We call it the life of the party. So to be a party pooper is to blaspheme the Spirit by acting as if the Spirit is your own spirit. It's holding your breath. (gasps) As if it's your own breath. It's to stop enjoying others and to start competing with others. It's to attempt to make the whole party about yourself. Hey, out to. The reflexive pronoun. So number four, who is committing the unforgivable sin? (coughs) The older brother who thinks that he has never disobeyed his father's command. So number five, who's in hell? The older brother. And God. (laughs) Or did we not notice? The father has left the party to join his oldest son in the outer darkness where he's weeping and gnashing his teeth. In other words, the man who has everything has given up everything in order to go stand next to his son who is weeping and gnashing his teeth in the outer darkness, which means, now listen closely, that it's somehow within the son's power to give the man who has everything, everything. And how's that? Well, all he has to do is forgive, right? Right? He forgives, and they both go back to the party. The sacrificial communion of endless delight, which is eternal life, the Father's house, the kingdom of heaven, where it is finished, and everything, 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 all creation is good. So, to be clear, number six, why is God in hell? Because the older brother won't forgive. For about 14 years, Susan and I prayed with a friend who had been richly wed to Satan, by her own father. So the craziest stuff. Her earthly father did this. She was afflicted with evil spirits that they would attach themselves to oaths and agreements that she had been forced to make while she was being abused. And to set her free, the Lord would have us go back to these memories and invite him to reveal himself there. And he would give new meaning to what had happened uh, in the past. And, And almost always, if not Always, if I think it through, the way out of these dark places and the way to free her of the demons was forgiveness. Forgiving does not mean judging an action and declaring it to be good. That's something more like excusing. So when people say, I can't forgive that, that's just inexcusable. They haven't yet even begun to understand what forgiveness means. Forgiveness is surrendering judgment, surrendering vengeance to God. Vengeance in Scripture literally means to make something right. Ekdikesis in Greek, bring out the righteousness. The Lord says over and over again, vengeance belongs to me. I used to say that to my kids. I will discipline, not you. (laughs) Vengeance belongs to me. When you forgive a me, you let go of vengeance. That's just what it means. You surrender judgment to the judge. You entrust it to God. For about 14 years, we would pray our way back into these memories that she had tried to forget. Susan would often see what our friend would see, which was incredibly hard for my wife. But time and time again, Jesus would help our friend renounce these oaths or what agreements she had taken and then forgive her abusers. And then these evil spirits would utterly just lose their power and our friend would begin to join the party in like every way you could talk about. Our friend now works with a ministry to children in a foreign country, but several years ago, one of the last times we prayed together, she had not only been struggling with forgiving her abusers and forgiving herself, forgiving herself, but but she was also struggling with forgiving God for allowing such horrors to ever happen in the first place. She had suffered the pain of reckless living and prostitution. You see, there is just an immense amount of pain that results from the father agreeing to the requests of his children. 
pain for the prodigal, pain for everyone associated with the prodigal, (laughs) including his brother who is also a prodigal, the older prodigal brother. Well, in prayer, as we prayed this, this time, she heard weeping and the sound of struggling. And so in prayer, we went looking for the source. And, and the Lord led us back to the door of a closet in which she had been locked up as a little girl. We fully expected to look inside and see her bound and tied and weeping in the dark. But when we looked inside, we found Jesus bound and tied and weeping in the dark. And the message seemed clear to me. As long as we refuse to forgive others, ourselves, even God, as long as we refuse to forgive, we trap ourselves in outer darkness. And as long as we trap ourselves in outer darkness, Jesus is trapped in outer darkness with us. And I hope you know that Jesus is the heart of our Father in heaven. Origen who was the most influential of the early church fathers for the first 500 years of the church's existence up until the time of Augustine. Origen, who understood that the cross stands at the edge of time and eternity. Origen taught that Christ remains on the cross as long as one sinner remains in hell. And at this point, I think every father, every remotely good father, good dad, can understand the gospel. When my son Coleman was little, he was often sentenced to the green couch. Sometimes he would just go there on his own, and I'd say, what did you do? He was often sentenced to the green couch, and then I would go sit on the green couch with him. When my children got older, they found themselves in deeper and deeper and deeper hells, and my heart was there with them, whatever it happened to be, if they gave me the privilege of knowing And I could not party as long as one of them was weeping alone in the darkness. The older brothers in the outer darkness and the father who has everything has given up everything for he will not leave or forsake his son. So this son could literally give his father everything by forgiving his brother. But you know how it is. Once you start forgiving, where do you stop? Forgive everyone and forgive everyone. You get yourself your own self crucified. If the older brother forgives his younger brother for taking his share of the inheritance, he'll also need to forgive himself for taking his own share of the inheritance and admit that neither one of them deserved the inheritance in the first, I mean, neither one deserved anything. And their father had given them everything. Everything was a gift. To forgive his brother, he needed to forgive himself for being offended by his brother. And you know, it's easier to just hide yourself, right, in deeper and deeper resentment. It's like a spiral. And even though his father did not do anything evil, he allowed for their evil. And so he'd need to forgive his brother himself and his father, forgive his father for being his father. In other words, he'd need to let his father be his father and his brother's father. Oh! I think that's the sticking point. It's hard to share your father, especially if he's a good father. I mean, so you understand the older brother, don't you? My two oldest children are only a year apart, and they used to argue about everything. But most of all, me. (laughs) Remember, they'd be sitting in their car seats in the back of their car, and one of them would say, I'm happy. And the other one would say, no, I'm happy. And one would say, I love daddy. And the other would say, no, I love daddy. And I know they were voicing their deepest fear because it's my deepest fear. If daddy loves you more, I'm terrified he'll love me less. And in some ways, that's true. Why? Because I only have so much time. And I only have so much space. And, and yet in my spirit, it's entirely untrue because I know that I love each one with all the love that I have or all the love that has me. And you see, love is not a limited commodity like space or time. I was the firstborn and only son of a father who loved me dearly. But in high school, Andrew Trawick 
needed a place to stay. And so he came and lived at my house, slept in my bedroom, was fathered by my father while I went off to see you, while I went off to college. And it nearly broke my heart. It's hard to share your father. But now I have a brother. A real brother. A, a great brother. My father was a pastor, and so there was a whole church that took his space, took his time, away from me. And then a group of them broke his heart. It took a miracle and, and at least 20 years for me to forgive them. And, and I know I still have to work on it. It's hard to share your father, but, but now I look forward to the day that we're all going to party as the New Jerusalem, and I know that my father, now I'm beginning to see this, my father never ever loved me any less. Jesus is our older brother, the firstborn to whom belongs the blessing and the birthright. Because we were jealous of his relationship with God our Father, we tried to take his relationship with God our Father by taking his life on a tree. And yet even as we took his life on the tree, he gave his life on the tree. He lifted his head and cried, Father, forgive them. Who? Us. His little brothers and sisters. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And why did he do that? 1 Corinthians 15, 28. He wanted to give everything to his father. And so he was calling every one of us home to party and giving us the desire to go home, his will to forgive. He was sharing his own father with you. When he rose from the dead, he said, I'm going to my father and your father. He taught us to pray. Taught the whole world to pray. Our father. It could be that in Luke 14, when Luke records Jesus is saying, unless you hate your own father, you can't be my disciple. He meant something like we must love Jesus more than our particular earthly dad. But I strongly suspect that he thinks Jesus is saying something like, your own father, the father that you think is your own, is an illusion called sin, which makes you take my life on the tree in the garden as if you thought the heart of our Father belonged to you and you alone. And that means that as long as you think God belongs to you and not to your brothers, you trap yourself in hell and you take me to hell with you. See, Luke was a Gentile. And the, the Jews claimed that God the Father belonged to them. Kind of kind of like some Christians say that God the Father belongs to them. And everyone else is going to hell. And isn't that ironic? The measure they give is the measure they get. But even more, they not only send themselves to hell, apparently they send God their Father to hell with them. Or perhaps inside of them. You know, Jesus did say to some that they were spawn of the devil. Do you remember who he said it to? The Jews. Just read it in the Gospel of John. He said it to the older brothers. But the devil is not the father of people. He's the father of what? Class, lies. He's the father of lies. He's the father of false people, that is, arrogant people, that is, people that think they have created themselves, and so they're better than their brothers and sisters. The f devil's the father of the self-centered human ego in which the little children of God are imprisoned. And therefore, God the Father is also imprisoned in the prison which you consider to be yourself. So anyway... Question number seven, okay? Why won't the older brother forgive? Join the party and so give everything to his father. Well, he obviously does not believe his father's word. And neither do you. And neither do I. Not yet. Do you remember what the father is saying to his son? as they stand in the outer darkness? I think it's exactly what he's saying to me and exactly what he's saying to you right now. And 
And yet every one of us suspects that he's lying. He says, you, he whispers this, I think, from behind the curtain in the inner sanctuary. He says, you are with me always. And along with the older brother, we think, how could I be with you or you with me always when only a few hours ago you were with my brother on the road to the far country? Do you ever hear stories of miracles in other people or signs of grace in other people? And to yourself, you think, why was he with them and not with me? He says, I am with you always, and, and you are with me always. And then he says, all that is mine Okay, this is a good time to believe the Bible if you can. He says, all that is mine is yours. And, and along with the other brothers, I don't think we say it, but I think we do think it. Bullshit. Do the math, God. You just gave half of all that you have to my brother. You just gave him the robe, the ring, the shoes. You just killed the fatted calf for him. How can you give all to both of us. Do you expect us to share everything as if this was some sort of endless party? And now, Father, you've already given half to him and half to me. What do you have left to give? You're good for nothing now. Nothing to give except maybe your heart, your heart naked and broken and nailed to a tree. Romans 8.32, God gave Jesus up for us all. How will he not also with him give us all things? Give us all things. Give us all things. Do you realize that for your father, space and time are no obstacle? <laughs> so he can literally be entirely with you and with your brother and your neighbor. Everyone, all at the same time. And he can literally give all that he has to you and all that he has to your brother, because for him, space and time are no obstacle. If there is an obstacle, is that you're too scared to open your eyes and see his heart. And so for the younger brother out on the road coming home from the far country, and for the older brother standing alone in the outer darkness, and for the Gentiles and for the Jews, and for the atheists and the Hindus and the Muslims and the Buddhists and for Judas and Peter, James and John and me and you, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my usias. This is my body given to you. Take it. Eat it. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. It's the bios. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. So do you hear what he's, what he's saying to you? I'm with you always. And you are with me always. And all that is mine is yours. And so what would you say to him? What would you give him on Father's Day? Maybe you just gave it. Maybe you just opened your heart and heard his word. And if you did, you will forgive. As you've been forgiven. And you will save him. If you're your own self-centered, arrogant self. Miserable self. You will repent. You will have a new mind and head back to the party. You will give him everything just as he delights in giving you everything. You see, that's the way it is between Jesus and his dad. Constant party. So right now, if you would, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. And I want you to think of everyone that has wronged you. Everyone that's still, and I'm just going to say it, pisses you off because that's how you say it inside. 
Maybe it's the younger brother who squandered what you thought was yours. And he seems to be enjoying the party already. Maybe the older brother who judged you irresponsible and worthless and rejoiced when you were, you know, sleeping with pigs in the far country. Maybe even the earthly dad who abused you as a child. Could be me. Pretty sure it's probably also yourself. Maybe the Nazis or Democrats or Republicans, you cannot fix them. But you can forgive them right now. So you have the list, the names. Now, just go through the list and say in the name of Jesus and then say the name. In the name of Jesus, I, I forgive so and so. And in the name of Jesus, I forgive so and so. I forgive this person. I forgive that person. You know, sometimes I just do this in prayer with everyone because I'm not sure who I'm really mad at or who's mad at me, but I just forgive them all because, you see, what I'm saying is that they don't owe me anything. because I know that my Father is giving me everything. Sometimes I do it out loud. I think it's an important thing to do out loud, maybe once a month or maybe once, once a week, because when you do, you're making a proclamation in the heavenly places that seriously, Jesus does this through you. It defeats the work of the evil one. You defeat the work of the devil, and you literally give the man who had everything and gave up everything, everything. So just keep forgiving. And and you probably just started now. You're going to have to keep going, maybe, well, for the rest of your life here, forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. And now, if there's someone that you're finding particularly hard to forgive, I want you to, to, to bring them to this table. This table which the Father has prepared before you and your enemy. He's prepared it before you in the presence of your enemy and he's prepared it for your enemy in the presence of, of you. Bring that person to this table and tell Jesus how you feel. And maybe... Maybe you could just say, Jesus, I'm having a hard time sharing. I'm having a hard time sharing my Father in heaven with this person. And then maybe you could just listen as you take the body broken and the blood shed, and he whispers to you in the darkness, and I'm sharing my Father with you. You are with me always. And all that is mine is yours. So let's forgive. My uh, father-in-law died last week. And uh, I got to pray that prayer into his ear as he was passing. (laughs) Psalm 23. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And... uh, I just thank God for that. And I think of my father today, and I definitely miss him. And today we talked about all sorts of complicated theological concepts, but you see, actually, they all become rather simple if you just believe what Jesus said when he said, I want you to pray, our father. And all of a sudden, I'm back in the red Toyota, going to Nebraska on vacation, and my sister Rachel pokes me in the leg. She went over the line, and I poke her in the leg, and then she complains to Dad, and and then Lydia complains to Dad, and finally Dad just loses it, and he says, could you just all get along? (laughs) That's what I want for Father's Day. I want you to forgive each other. I said, but, 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 vengeance belongs to me, Peter. (laughs) And that's what you can give your father for Father's Day. 
And you see, yeah, our problems are bigger, aren't they? They're more painful, they're more difficult. I mean, we're talking about wars and famine and rape and all sorts of horrific things, but everything is big to you when you're two years old. And you are the little children of God. And soon you'll be home and your father, oh, he has absolutely everything. And you can give him everything, the man who has everything. You can literally give him everything by forgiving your brothers and sisters and everyone that's anyone is your brother and your sister. And maybe there's one other thing that you, the sanctuary in particular, can give him. And that is that you can preach the gospel to Christians and so save them from the outer darkness where older brothers weep and gnash their teeth and where God our Father suffers with them. You can preach the word uh, to them, and we are them, by saying, God is always with you. And all that he has is yours, which would include your brother, your younger brother, your older brother, the atheists, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Republicans, the Democrats. Hallelujah. Heaven is going to be one heck of a party. So believe the gospel and give your father a wonderful Father's Day. Amen.